I need a hundred beers. Exactly. Exactly one hundred. Thank you. Welcome back to Tap Tempo with me, Matt Lang. This is episode 10, and um, I'm a little bit surprised we made it this far, but we did. So fortunately, we do have something a little bit special in store for you this time around. Before we get into that, uh, got a few gigs coming up this weekend on Friday the 8th. I'm in New York City at Output. The next night on Saturday the 9th, I'm in Montreal at Newspeak. And then fast forward six days later, on Friday the 15th, I'm in London, Ontario at the Block Party Festival, sponsored by Bud Light, which is kind of funny considering what happens next in this episode. And then on the 16th, that Saturday, I'm back in Chicago at Soundbar once again, and we are doing the whole thing in Dolby Atmos this time around. And that is super exciting. So let's talk about this episode. A few days ago, I got a knock on my door, and I go out, UPS truck is gone, but instead, there are a few boxes, and it apparently seemed to be a bunch of Budweiser and Bud Light and all the variations thereof. So I called up Anthony Baldino, discussed the opportunity thereof, and we decided, really, the only appropriate thing to do with that much Budweiser is just to pour it down the drain. So... We drove first to the Stone Company store in Pasadena, picked up a growler of uh, one of their Pilot Pale Ales, which was actually delicious. And we had that while, as you will hear, pouring out 100 beers over the course of this one show. And we also talk lots of music stuff. Anthony is my closest friend, an amazing human being, and also incredibly talented. As you can tell from the rapport, you know, it's it's a very casual and much, uh, it's a much looser conversation as... uh, That is how we do, and we usually have these conversations at least once a week. So to give a little backstory also, the whole concept of doing this show came to be when Anthony and I were sitting at the Highland Park Brewery uh, some months ago, and it was just the kind of thing where we were talking, and it it was like, man, we should put a microphone in front of this. So Anthony, from the very start, has been a big part of this show. The music he does himself is just beautiful, and it's incredibly intricate, extremely well-produced. It's beyond impressive. And I'm really excited he's here. So without further ado, here's Anthony Baldino and I and 100 Beers. So we've got 100 beers here. Almost exactly 100. And um, thanks to the kind folks at Anheuser-Busch, I figured the only appropriate thing to do with 100 beers, especially of Budweiser, is just dump it all down the drain. It's the smart move. It's really the only way to play it. Yeah, I don't I don't know why they'd ever send it, but they did. So I think, you know, we should do them the honor of sending it down a slow, dark funeral, one beer at a time. And uh, with that said, cheers. Cheers. Goodbye, Bud Light. There she goes. It's so thin looking. It does kind of look like water. Yeah. Or bad iced tea. Kind of feel like we should try one. Oh, I know. I just... How about we try this delicious looking Bud Light lime? Oh, let's try the lime. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hand me one of those. Here you are. Okay. Twist off. Forgot that's a thing. Cheers. Uh, Yeah. Oh, God. Where many men has boldly gone before. Oh, you fuck. That's so bad. Oh my god, that's like bad Sprite. It is. It's exactly like expired Sprite. That's fucking hideous. Jesus Christ. Ugh. This is an endeavor. It's going to be a long podcast. It's going to be a long podcast. (laughs) On the bright side, uh, we were smart and we got a growler of a pilot stone pale ale. What's it called? I don't know. It's one of those days. Yeah, yeah. Um... How is your day going? It's one of those days. My day is pretty bad. I'm not going to lie. Why? Love. What about love? It's brutal. And it hurts. Love hurts. Over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And even though you want it to work really bad. Doesn't always work. It does not. Nope. Nope. 
But fortunately, we now have 96 beers left oh. to help you get through that. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing like getting rid of lost love, like just pouring it down the drain. Down you go. <laughs> Into the same black abyss where my heart is. Into the incinerator. Ugh. Goodbye. That's hideous. Well, on the bright side, the good thing about Heartbreak, you write a lot of good music. Yeah. But it still hurts. Yeah, yeah, but you get something good out of it. Yeah. That's like documenting. For me, it's kind of like uh, being able to have a tangible thing that you can reach back. Yeah. Kind of put your hands on and yeah. revisit that time in your life if you ever need to or want to. I find when I do that stuff, I'm super present in the moment of it. And then after I finish it, because I'll, I'll put so much time into it. Yeah. Then I can't ever listen to it ever again. Because it'll, really? like, it'll transport me back to that feeling. Oh, yeah. That's the point. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't want to feel that again. <laughs> I save those for very special days. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I try to avoid that when I yeah. can. Just... Uh, are you writing right now? I am. Um, not doing anything to do with said heartache, but uh, mostly just glitchy electronic stuff. Yeah. Typical yeah. me. Yeah. So you're using lots of modular gear? Lots and yeah. lots. Um, What's your newest acquisition on the modular front? Newest would be... Um, Make Noise Morphogene. Oh, yeah. 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 Which is awesome. Yeah. And I still haven't barely scratched the surface because it's just so easy to get something so beautiful out of it. Right. Right out of the gate. Yeah, I need to get my hands on one of those. Do it. Yeah. Well, I'll reach out to them at some point. Yeah. Because, yeah, I remember trying the demo of it at Rodent's house. And like you said, it's like Steve Reich in a box. Yeah. Which is unbelievable awesome. yeah. that's so cool yeah and it, like so easily just makes things that i would never make just, right or even think of so what do you think which modules do you think you've gotten the most um inspiration in that context where it was ideas that you didn't think you would have come across normally mm. um make noise renee yeah um just getting all sorts of different sequences that, you know, you can make it so random or yeah, whatever. But that, um, obviously, morphogene and phonogene before that. Makes sense. Um, clouds. Oh, how could I forget clouds? Endless source of inspiration. That one... Yeah, I got a ton. Um, that last track I played you, the uh, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. that one. Yeah, um, that initially started because I was feeding like uh, basically some piano singer songwriting stuff um, into it, yeah. and just freezing it and then gating it at a sixteenth note or something. And that became this pulsing rhythm in the background, and everything was ultimately built around that. Awesome. Yeah, like all the vocals, everything came from that initial little. Oh, it's amazing. Like granule or whatever you know that idea that came out of something that was repurposed so that's why i have two clouds yeah oh that's right and you have what like six mats i just bought my seventh seven mats yeah all lightning bolt maths old school (laughs) so i think you might have a guinness world record for most maths outside of make noise oh it's possible we need to find out yeah you should like email tony find out if anyone has ever bought more than you there can only be one. You could have a case of entirely nothing but maths. I'm going to do it. You should. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I can. Why not? I think it would be fun. I'm going to dump a Bud Light Platinum. Oh, we should try that before you dump it. Okay. Can you hand me one, please? I can. Thank you. I'm sorry in advance. Oh, that's okay. Hopefully I don't spit it out like the lime. Oh. <laughs> Oh, it's... Oh, cheers. God, it looks like it's coming out of a cauldron. Of misery. It's not as bad. Yeah. It's terrible, but... Wow. It's triple filtered. 
Premium 6% alcohol, light beer. They shouldn't have stopped at three. No, no, they had to double it up. I like it when the beer companies have 6.66% alcohol. It's rare nowadays you find that. It's silly fun, though. <laughs> <laughs> we had that one last, what was it, the Rogue? Rogue Six Hop IPA? Yeah, I can't remember much about the beer other than the 6.66%. Yeah, yeah it wasn't that memorable. It wasn't eight, bad. No, no, it was totally drinkable. It was okay. But at the end of the day, yeah. I like this, the stone. Yeah, this is good. Yeah, it's solid. It works. Yeah. How's your day going? I feel bad I didn't ask you. Yeah, it's all right. My day's kind of weird. Yeah? Any reason? Love. Ah. Yeah. Complications. Yes. The usual. The usual. Yeah. The same boat of misery. Yeah. But it's it's a weird comp. Like, it's a boat of misery right now that, like, I'm not heartbroken. Mm-hmm. I'm oh, just... <laughs> I'm more just uh, a little bit confused. Yeah. And so consequently, it's not really inspiring me at all. Oh. Which is, you know, kind of disappointing. Like, it's not like I'm having, like, yeah. my heart ripped out of my chest or anything like that. Stagnant emotionally it's just and musically. One of those, like, what the hell is going on here kind of things and lack of communication, which, God, millennials and their communication skills are just. It's amazing. I. An entire generation of people who just don't know how to communicate or choose not to, or yeah, and yeah, and it sucks. It makes it it makes things really confusing. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm going through that. I'm sorry. Eh, that's what it is. What we got each other for? Exactly. And beer. And beer. And ninety eighty eight beers, maybe. Oh, I, don't know. I stopped counting. Mm-hmm. I did too. But I, like we're almost through the first. 30 rack, <laughs> which is pretty good. What have you been listening to recently? Oh, man. Because of my awesome, awesome state of emotional goodness. Yes. That. Actually, <laughs> been listening to a lot of Roy Orbison. Really? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, all the typical Elliot Smith... I really just don't want to feel any better today type of music. You want to like embrace the misery. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I know how to do. Okay. I can't, I can't go halfway on anything. So what if just for variety's sake, you put on something that would make you feel good. Oh, that comes after. Uh, okay. You, you got to hit rock bottom first. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And okay. then I put converge on right, right. Jane Doe. And then I instantly feel and we should note, today's Jane Doe Day. It is Jane Doe Day. Jane Doe came out 16 years ago today. And we're both wearing Converge shirts. It's true. And it was unplanned. Because we're that awesome. Or that obsessed with Converge. Yeah, probably just obsessed. Yeah, um, a little bit. We're not that awesome. They would never, they, we, we're the fans that would terrify them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those guys again. You know, like, Kurt, uh, the guitarist from Converge, he has all these, like, handmade guitar pedals now. Really? Yeah, yeah, he keeps post. He's been selling them at all their shows. Then they're just one-offs or like oh, of his own. Of his own, yeah. Oh. It's called like God City Instruments. Okay. And yeah, they're all just you know hand wired, um, like distortion and fuzz pedals. I need that. Yeah, I want to get one. Does he sell them online? He has a Reverb.com store. Perfect. So I've thought about it. Yeah. I just <sighs> so good. How cool would it be to have like a piece of gear oh, made by Kurt? By Kurt, right? Oh man, I would love that. Sign me up. Mm -hmm. They're using them all in the new album, apparently. So, I wonder if you could put it in a module. Well, theoretically, um, because I just got the Dwarfcraft Great Destroyer. Oh yeah, the Eurorack version of the Dwarfcraft pedal, and the pedal itself is like just sheer sonic annihilation. And Perfect. in Eurorack form, it's sheer sonic annihilation, but with CV control. You gotta love that. It's never clean. That's good. <laughs> There's no mix knob. Like you can take, you put a sine wave in there, and you're just gonna get fucked up garble mm -hmm. after. And no matter how you tweak it, it's just variations of how. It's not even variations of how fucked up the garble is. Yeah. It's always fucked. It's variations of what brand of fucked up garble. <laughs> 
flavor of the day. <laughs> Basically. So, no, I... Yeah, you should play with that at some point. Yeah. That's a fun one. I like that. I like those... The guys that run Dwarfcraft. They're just, like, sweethearts. And Have we, you met them? No, just over, like, uh, emails and stuff gotcha. like that, you know. We've talked, but... Um, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. They're based out of Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Oh. There are a lot of pedal guys out there. It's strange. Interesting. Maybe it's just because it gets so cold there that, you know, in the winter you have nothing to do but stay in but your... solder stuff? Yeah. Stay in your sense. basement, solder stuff, and, you know, come out a bit weirder after. That is one thing I miss about living on the East Coast. Yeah. Is just kind of being forced to stay inside. Mm-hmm. I'm not that I go outside that much now anyway. Right. Well, I mean, now the heat's forcing us to stay yeah. inside also. So, but you get a lot done. Yeah. I need my outside time. I really do. I not need, I. <laughs> that's like, that's part of why I live here. It's the sun. Um, that's why I don't like living here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just too hot. I don't think it's that hot. Cause it's not humid. Like New York heat. When you're walking down the, like, the sidewalk and it's, yeah. I don't know, it's August and your shoes are sticking to the concrete. Yeah, there is that. You know, I don't miss that. I just feel like I'm always under a blow dryer, like artificial heat. Yeah, it's weird. It's definitely different. But I don't mind it. I like it. Okay. Yeah. I'm happier out here. Fair. Yeah. Fair enough. We don't want me going back to New York. No. No. Unless I go. And then you come with me. Uh, can I just come visit you? Yes. I don't want to live there again. Okay. It's too cold. I can't do the winter thing ever again. Oh, I, oh, I know. We've been slacking. Sorry. Oh, shit. It just <laughs> spewed all over me. That's what you get. This is probably because, you know, I ran the shopping cart off the uh, the sidewalk. <laughs> that was impressive. <laughs> it was like the X Games of... Shopping cart filled with beer. It was kind of like a jackass moment, but at the same token, it's Bud Light. So, you know, it's kind of like, let's beat it up a little bit. It deserves to be beaten up. I just didn't have the foresight to remember that the beers would kind of be a little bit explodey on our return. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. But at least you smell nice afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Aroma by Anheuser-Busch. Oh. Yeah. Mmm. The last date you ever had. <laughs> Calvin Klein, Bud Light. <laughs> <laughs> this is what they sell in frat bars. Oh, God. Yeah. It's just Bud Light and date rape. Basically. Yeah. Basically. Don't you want to go out to one of those now? All the time. I don't miss those. No. I think the only time I ever really went out to those were... That was when we were in Boston. Yeah. It's because just so many of the bars there were... Yeah. Like it, that. It was hard to avoid. Yeah. When was the last time you were there? I think two two years ago. Okay. You were doing the modular show? Neil Leonard? That was that was a couple years before that. Um that was an awesome show. Yeah. Um Oh, that was at the museum, right? Yeah, it was me, Jason oh I'm blanking on his last name. I'll come back with that. But uh, Gotti was there. Gotti Sassoon was there, too. Yeah. So that was a lovely show. That would have been awesome. I love Gotti. I miss that guy. Yeah. Me, too. God, these fucking things keep like, <laughs> just shooting all over me every time. Would you like a bib? How about a towel? You could do that. Yeah. Oh, it's just... Episode 10. Pour a hundred beers down the drain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running out of space to put all these cans. Yeah, I just started stacking mine on the uh, the counter for now, and I figure, you know, when we open up the next 30 rack very shortly, then uh, just replenish the trash. Smart. Yeah, working on it. I don't know. Down you go. Bye-bye. Well, in more exciting news, I believe you have... A little EP coming out with the one and only Detroit Underground. I do. Tell me about that. Um, really excited about that. Because yeah. obviously Detroit Underground is Detroit Underground. Like, Yeah, yeah. Um, one of my favorite electronic labels for a long, long time. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they'd probably be at this point my number one 
pick for if I got to release anything on a label, huh. it would be Detroit. I mean, if Hefty was still around. Yeah, yeah. But those were the good old days. I know. Um, That's a nostalgia thing, too. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, anyway, it's, it started out mostly modular, like straight out of the machine. I'd build a patch and figure out kind of the choreography of it, how to perform it. Right, um, right. And I got about four or five tracks in with th- that type of uh, approach, and it just, oh, have yourself a Bud Light Lime. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Um, and when I started to listen back as the collection grew, it just didn't have any soul to it. Not soul, but like, it just sounded cool and didn't, yeah. ha- I wasn't saying anything or right, right. didn't really feel much. Um, it was just cool music. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I think that makes for you, you also are a classically trained musician. True. So, I mean, that's like we've spoken about this and you know yeah. Sarah and I talked about it a few weeks ago and that's that whole thing is when you do have that traditional background um while yes you'll get a ton of inspirational ideas and a modular and they can do things that no other yeah no other instrument can possibly do or get you to think like that but what it's not probably going to do and I could be I just I don't think you're not going to it's not going to be as expressive as when you run your finger on a cello string and you bow it. Right. And I think it it can be. Yeah. But every time I get something to be like that or I feel that emotion from it, right. I end up spending so much more time thinking about like how should I patch this? How should I approach this? And it becomes more about the process than yep. the music. Yep. Yep. Um which can be really cool. It can have really awesome outcomes and I certainly like the music I've been doing, but there was definitely a shift. I just stumbled on this one patch. It was just this really beautiful sequence kind of doubled over on itself using the phonogene. And it triggered that, like, oh, right, emotion, mm-hmm. music, yes, right. Yeah. That's what we're doing here. Yeah. So I started going back to where I've, I'm kind of used to coming from, of like, here's an idea, and then I'll flush the whole thing out in logic. Um, and just start putting in weird sounds, yeah. making weird beats. And what was your first instrument? The saxophone. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Were you in like school band? Or? Yeah. Okay. I was in school band from fifth grade. No, sixth grade. All the way till senior year. Yeah. And it's miserable. I had the worst band teacher in high school, I should say. Really? He was, he's the only person I've ever known to willingly listen to John Philip Sousa for fun. Mm. Yeah, that was his, his go to. Uh, That's harsh. And so, because of that, since I played, I started on alto and then got to baritone in high school. So then he just gave me a bunch of tuba parts to play because there was no tuba player. Mm nice yeah real yeah. nice and after that was bass guitar yep and probably in eighth grade i started uh started playing bass because i had really lousy friends at the time and i really wanted to play guitar and they were all in bands and so i'd go and hang out and uh this one guy keith yeah <laughs> He's just kind of snobby about his guitars. I'm like, man, can I try playing your guitar? Like, no, can't play my guitar. Well, I have this old thing you can play, and it's this piece of garbage Radio Shack guitar with a 9-volt battery in the back. Perfect. And a speaker built into it called the Terminator. <laughs> and uh, it only had, like, three strings on it. Amazing. Yeah, and so... I didn't know anything about restringing guitars, but I was just happy to have a guitar. Have, yeah. Yeah. And he, he sold it to me for 25 bucks. So amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, that led to like some other guys calling me randomly saying, you play three string guitar. We need a bass player. 
Do you want to play bass in our band? <laughs> you play a three-string guitar. We need a bass player. <laughs> and that's actually how I got into playing bass. <laughs> and of course, like, it's... Looking back on it, it's kind of insulting. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at the time, like, I didn't really have many friends and was far from being a cool kid. Yeah, yeah. So I was flattered and was like, yeah. And so my dad, who's just a gem of a person, took me to the guitar store, bought me a bass. Did it have three strings on it? I had four. four I had okay. all four strings. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and then I just played bass in punk bands and... Eventually got to Berkeley and started playing a lot of funk. You? Yeah. A uh, big James Jamerson fan. Okay. Um, All right. At the time, at least. Yeah. And back then, I was really good. But um, part of the reason I got into electronic music was because I could do it by myself. Yeah, you don't need a band. Yeah. Yeah. And Berkeley is a great place to be and a great place to meet people. We were there at such a good time, yeah, too. Yeah, we were like the golden age I know. of Berkeley. I'm really, really fortunate that we went through that. Yeah. Um, but all the bands that I ended up playing in was the kind of typical, like, it's my turn to solo, still. Yeah. Seven hours later. Like, yeah. I mean, that was Berkeley bands for you. Yeah, and it's just, guys, none of this matters. Like, this band's not going to make it. And I just got really tired of the ego and... Well, you know, that it being the most important thing in the world. So the kind of funny thing about that, too, is that um, because Berkeley, in a way, it's like the grand equalizer because everyone who goes there is basically the strongest musician in their own district. Yes. Wherever that is. Yes. And then um, you get to Berkeley and you ain't shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm not good. No. <laughs> I think yeah. it's great. You need that. You yeah. Know? I remember that. Yeah. That first, because they have the rating system that you have to play. Yeah. When you get there. And, like, <laughs> and it goes one to eight. Yeah. 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 And I was so excited. Mm-hmm. I was so excited. I was like, I'm going to go in. I'm going to do this. I'm just gonna, it's going to be awesome. Yeah. And I do it. And I get my ratings back. And I got twos across the board. So, but then, to make it even better. Oh, no, no, no. This is different. But just uh, so in the base department. My first year of Berkeley, when you have like nine classes at a time. Yeah. So I got an A minus in my bass lessons. Okay. And uh, so I come back to lessons the next semester. Teacher asked how I was doing. I was like, you know, I'm doing really well. Like, I'm really proud. I got an A minus last semester. Like, I was really burnt out and like thought I was kind of behind. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We always give an A minus or an A to everybody so they stay in school. And don't drop out. Oh, my God. And I'm like, oh, so you're saying, he's like, yeah, you probably should have got like a B minus or something, <laughs> maybe a C. I was like, thanks. Wow, Berkeley. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, my God. I remember I auditioned with um, Joe Stump. Oh, the he, legend. Yeah, yeah. It was like a Engve Momstein type. He, yeah. He was the resident 80s shredder. Oh, yeah. He's probably like 60 at this point. Still I'm sure of it. dyed black hair, yeah, yeah. black sunglasses, Living the black dream. leather, everything totally. every day. <laughs> yeah. And I remember um, when I came in, he just had me play blues with him. Okay. And which was kind of an odd choice because I've never been a big blues player. Yeah, same. But um, I think also. Hello. Hi. I think a lot of the like a lot of the kids when they come in, they have you know. Flight of the Bumblebee prepared or yeah. something like that. And I didn't. You know, I played in like a metal band. Yeah. You know, like, and it wasn't, you know, shred metal. Like, I was into just like odd time signatures and weird, you know, jazzy chord changes and right. stuff like that. But it wasn't the, you know, a million notes per minute. And so consequently, then being placed with the guy who is the million notes per minute guy yeah. at Berkeley, it was kind of one of those, uh, I don't really know what to do here. <laughs> Help. And I thought I was good at guitar, and then just like you, twos flat across uh, the board. It was one of those like, oh, ouch! And then you know the guy across the hall like comes in and like gets eights and oh, has yeah. a full ride to Berkeley yeah. the entire time. And it's, it's, just, it's funny, I, I that exact thing. The guy across the hall is a bass player. Yep, uh, played like a twelve thousand string bass. Right, all eights. Couldn't write a piece of music to save his life. Amazing how that works out. 
Yeah. Yeah. I was always fascinated by that. Yeah. Could play anything you put in front of them, just hear something once, have it memorized, read anything. Well, it all comes down to your training, too. True. If what you've been trained to do ultimately is just um, recite, you can become, you know, amazing at sight reading and right. technically perfect. But when you're asked to come up with an original idea because you've never been asked to explore that side of you before. True. That's going to be really challenging. Yeah. So that makes sense. I mean, it does. Looking back on it, I was just very surprised at the time. Yeah. So then you get out here to L.A. It was like post-Berkeley. Mm-hmm. What's your first move? First move. Um, I'm trying to remember what my first, my first gig was. I think my first... Uh, gig or job was doing a working on a score with ed Shermer. okay he's a a film composer yeah um and a good buddy of mine chris lane we were working a lot together at the time so we're just doing like ambient musical sound design for lack of better terms okay so he just kind of give us the sketch of his cue and we'd flush it out with electronics and yeah sure other stuff um Which is probably the first time I kind of realized if you're going to spend time on anyone's music, it should be your own. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> because he, he was one of those guys. I'm really grateful for it, but he was just so opinionated and so nobody is right except for me type of guy. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. But then from there... There I started working at BevMo because I really needed to pay pay the rent. <laughs> um, and then after that, I started working... Uh, actually, before I even got to any of that, I should say, again, my dad, gem of a person, yeah. forced me to... He said every, every morning from 9 to noon, make it your day job to just look at every Craigslist, every like Mandy, uh, entertainmentcareers.com post... Every day, even if you get nothing, and just re- reply to everything. So Really? Yeah. So, and of course, at the time, I'm like, oh, Dad, I don't want to do this. Yeah, of course. God. But f- sure enough, I ended up working with um, Jerome Dillon. Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. Um, Nine Inch Nails, and he's doing film stuff at the time. So, yeah, that was... What did you do with him? I did all the programming and mixing... Um, we were mostly working on uh, records for his project, nearly. Uh-huh. Um, and then started some film work, but by the time we actually got deep into a film, um, because the way things always work in L.A. is everything is delayed and pushed back. Yeah, yeah. I had uh, stuff with a current company I work with for trailers, uh, a project lined up for that, so I left... And that was the first time I actually got to do work for myself. And like, nice. Yeah, my uh, just kind of my own musical career really started to a take off and b be affordable. To yeah, do. <laughs> yeah, it's not cheap. No, so you know, you've been doing the. Tra- I mean, primarily, it's like most of your time is trailer music right now. And yeah, I mean, you kill it at that. Thank you. So, well, I mean. Just look at your credit list. You know, I don't have to tell you. It is long. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, so I mean, now I think like you're still you're kind of trying to find the balance now of, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like balancing your own personal work against just I guess the rigors of the trailer industry. Yeah, um, trailer music is awesome for me at least because it's. I mean, it's awesome in general, but. It's always been good for me because being an electronic musician... It plays to your strengths. Yeah, it's a medium that lets me be really weird, and you get calls that ask to be really weird. Right. Um, But yeah, I just... It really fits my palette and my strengths. So, uh, But yeah, I'm trying to... I've been doing that for a long time. I really haven't made much of my own music. Um, Yeah. So you're feeling the itch. Yeah, I really miss it. I bet. Um, I also miss being quiet. 
and a lot of trailer music inevitably ends up at 11. Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, super maxed out. Yeah. Yeah, and like all of the drums. Right, right, and all every, the time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is awesome, but after a few years, several years of doing that, you're missing the subtlety. Yeah, I'm missing yeah. the subtlety, and I'm missing, you know, you know how it is with a lot of industry gigs. It's so fast now. Uh-huh. The turnaround time is just ridiculous. Um, yeah, we need it today, end of day. Yeah, literally. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it used to shock me, but now I'm, whenever I get that call, it's just like, oh, yeah, obviously. Mm-hmm. I'll talk to you in a couple hours. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, so I also miss just having eight bars and, like, I'm just going to sit with eight bars all day and just tweak and tweak because it feels good. Yeah. Um, and tweak melodies until something you actually feel and have time to feel. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Instead of just... Because I'm sure you probably... I bet you go on autopilot a lot on certain gigs. You have to. Yeah. Absolutely have to. Because um, there's things that you just have to get done. Right, right. And just... Time is money, and yeah. and time is also the deadline. Exactly. Yeah. So, so if you look back on all the trailer stuff you've done, what do you think your favorite campaigns that you've landed have been? My favorite um, to this day was Prometheus. Yeah. Um, which is one of the first tracks I ever did. It's very, very nine inch nailsy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, very weird. I don't know. I'm trying. To, that's a good question. Probably there's one cue that gets used a lot, but got, was mostly used in uh, Zero Dark Thirty. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just the most violent modular music I've ever made. Really, I mean, it's pretty much like one consistent sound as trailer music tends to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but in between is just these dissonant, distorted, brutal synth swells, and it makes me really happy. <laughs> what did you use for the brutal, distorted synth swells? It's all ARP 2600. Yeah. Yeah, that was my first synth. Still use that a ton, eh? Oh, yeah. all the time. Yeah, you're lucky. Those are fun. Yeah, I am lucky. I got that for a steal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you were to get any synth now, not modular, just like... Mm-hmm. Freestanding sense. What'd yeah. you get? I would. I'd probably get a Jupiter Eight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's the okay. one thing I, I don't have is anything that I can do. You don't have a poly. I don't have a poly. Right. I'm always building them. Right. Uh, right. So I'd do that, or I'm really curious about Deckard's Dream. Is that uh, CS80, CS80 clone? clone? Right. Um. Yeah, I don't know. What else I'd get? Moog? No. Moog. Nah, nah. I would. I would love some good Moog goodness. Mm-hmm. Good Moog goodness. Yeah. Whatever. Everyone needs a Moog. Um, but the system that I would want is so breathtakingly expensive. Do you want a modular? Yeah. Okay. Even though you asked, not modular. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, um, you found a loophole. True. Um, I don't know. I don't know what else I'd get. There's not much. I mean, there's not much new stuff coming out that's that gets me curious. Aside from modular stuff, no. And um, I mean, while there's been a slight resurgence in analog sense, I mean, the analog polys for the most part that are coming out are just like the two hundred dollar Korgs. Yeah, or no. that Behringer. Right, yeah, okay. Deep mind thing. Right, but aside from them, and then there's the uh, Modor. I always think Mordor. Mordor. Which, like, I wish that <laughs> set was called Mordor. That would be amazing. Um, but I think that's still, I don't think that's analog. I think that's virtual analog. I don't think I know that one. It's five grand. Whoa. Yeah, it's, ex- it's got to be analog if it's five grand. Well, you never know. It's got to be. Um, but aside from that, I can't really think of any analog polys. I mean, there's the Dave Smith stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I've never been a huge fan of it. Yeah, it's, it's nice. I would definitely use it if someone gave one to yeah. me. Yeah. 
But yeah. Every time I play them, the price tag just, I immediately think of a lot of other things I could do. Have you checked out the OB6, the Oberheim that Dave Smith's making? I know of it. I haven't checked it out. I think it's the best Dave Smith synth okay. he's made. And it's probably because it's an Oberheim. Yeah. But it sounds great. But it's just like, you know, Oberheim engine with like the Dave Smith GUI, yeah. ba- or not GUI because it's not digital, but you know what I mean? The layout. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's very Dave Smithy, but it sounds like an Oberheim. And I, I love Oberheims. Yeah. Like, Would you get a two voice? The new two voices? I want a four voice. That would be awesome. Yeah. I used to use one of those back at a BT studio back okay. in the day. And I love the sound of that thing. That, yeah. There, I mean, there are a few since I've heard ever that sounded like that. Yeah. That was amazing. So, yeah. I'd like one of those. Even just an SEM. Oh, yeah. You know? Because I love the notch filter. Or the filters in general. Mm-hmm. But, like, I love the notch on it. Yeah. So, yeah. That would... I don't have space for that stuff right now. <laughs> I'm always out of space. Yeah. And fuck, I mean, shit. Your your modular system is like six cases wide at this point. Four tip top two fifty twos. Okay. And a custom dark modular case. Okay. Um, I just filled everything up. Right. Do you have a graveyard of like surprisingly not lost modules? I do have a few that I can't fit. Yeah. Um, the island of lost modules. <laughs> it's a very sad island. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I would inevitably buy another case. Yeah. And just keep going. Where are you going to put it? Like, I'm asking out of my own curiosity because I've run out of space. No idea. Right. Um, I'm definitely at the point where I need just a big custom case. Okay. Um, yeah. Because even the tip top purple cables mm-hmm. the really long ones yeah they don't reach, don't reach. <laughs> oh no um, so yeah I don't know I had been planning to have something custom made yeah but then Los Angeles being Los Angeles and very hot in the summer I started to realize how hot it got with just five cases right and since I don't have central air conditioning, I realize this would be a problem, so I should probably move. I should focus on yeah. <laughs> just getting a bigger room first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So With central air. Yes, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Mandatory. <laughs> Smart. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. So you're looking for a new place? Yep. I mean, uh, excluding the heat issue, the need for more space... I'd like to contend that really the reason to move is because you need a bigger home for your Godzillas. I did not think about that. It's a valid point. I do have a maybe not disgusting collection of Godzillas, but enough to not get me a date ever again. You just need to date a Godzilla. I didn't think about that. There's a Craigslist for that. That's terrifying. Cosplay, Godplay... God play. There's got to be it somewhere. <laughs> well, we're going to Comic Con. We're going to Comic Con. You're wearing your best dressed Godzilla suit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're going to find you a Godzilla et. No, no. I'm just going to stick to plastic Godzillas. Okay, okay. I have zero risk of getting hurt. That's a lie. Oh, true. <laughs> Well, what if one of your Godzillas fell? Mm, I would cry. Right. I would cry. There's always the risk of emotional pain. Yeah. I mean, the last one I got, it's from late 80s, early 90s, robotic. Really? Yep. Okay. It could potentially just decide to walk off the counter to its death. That would be dreadful. It would be. Is this the one that's three feet tall? That's the one. Right. Okay. <laughs> Is there another Godzilla you have your eye on? Duh. Go on. So there's this place in Little Tokyo. Yeah. Have you been to the Little Tokyo Mall? Uh, yeah, I've eaten there. Yeah. Okay. So down below, okay. there's just all these awesome Japanese hello, cartoon and comic stores. They have a, 
I'm going to guess four and a half foot tall Godzilla. Okay. It will be mine. Okay. It's only $4,000. Do they make a six foot tall Godzilla? No. Well, maybe. Someone has to. And then are Godzilla's priced basically $1,000 per foot? Mm, good question. I have no idea. Because you could do like nail a really, really awesome trailer, one that pays you stupid amounts of money, and then commission a 12 foot tall Godzilla. That would be awesome. Or I would love to just do the music for the next Godzilla movie. Maybe uh, take like. You know, a little less money mm-hmm. for a whole bunch of Godzillas. Right, 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 right. I would do that deal. That's fair. I was at Sarah's house the other night, and um, for Call of Duty, they gave her a, it's a Call of Duty, it's like a three-inch tall bullet that's also a bottle opener. What? Oh, so cool. That's amazing. Yeah, unbelievable. I need gifts like that. I know. It's like, I'll do Call of Duty just for the bottle opener. Seriously, don't say that. If they would hire me. Take, oh, yeah. yeah. Take that paycheck. I want the paycheck, <laughs> but I really want the bottle opener. Yeah. That's, that's special. I would take that. Do you want to move more into full-on scores? Uh, or just expand into that, I suppose. Expand. I, yeah. I just want to expand in general. I've been doing trailers for so long um, that I was working on a video game recently. Yeah. Um, of which I cannot say. No, nope. um, but it was nice. It was a really nice change of pace into a bit more long form. Yeah, um, yeah. Where, like we were talking about before, trailers sometimes you just have to go on autopilot. But well, it's also everything has to be two and a half minutes. Yeah, even if even if you don't, even if you have time to think about it, there's no like you don't bring that theme back ever. Right. Because it's just a standalone yeah. idea. Right. Um, and you're competing with dialogue and all the sound effects they put on top of you and all that. Yeah. Um, but I'd love to get more into film. That was actually the reason I moved out here. Yeah. Was to do film. Yeah, um, me too. But I'd love to do that and then get more into video games. Yeah. Because I really like that that process. Yeah. Um, yeah. The kind of nonlinear yeah writing approach yeah but still it still has a script oh absolutely yeah um but when implemented right 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 um yeah it gives you more freedom in a way yeah in a way though i mean i kind of feel like having the linear thing that can be helpful yeah um just so you have an outline oh totally you know what you're trying to write and then um the open-endedness of games can that offers a different challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Which is fine. But what game scores do you like? Oh man. That game insides inside. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Insides insides. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a little indie game, but it's just so perfectly moody and dark. That's the one where the composer, put some of his instrumentation through the resonance of a human skull. Yep. Right. That's the one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know how much of it he ran through or what that process was like. Yeah. But I need to meet him. Yeah. And talk about this. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But love that one. Um, always listen to the doom soundtrack oh. by Mick Gordon. Oh, Mick is so good. Yeah. That you know, soundtrack that score is, is amazing. Stupid. <laughs> Oh, I get so excited when I listen to that. Right? Oh, it's so good. It's so good, and it's so well done. Like, it just... The production's amazing. Oh. The writing's brilliant. Yeah. The sound design. Yeah. It just... He he hit that one so far out of the park. Yep. Yeah. Jealous. <laughs> I use that as a reference. A oh, lot. yeah. All the time. Yeah. I use that a lot if I'm doing anything with guitars and trailer music. Yeah. Because it's... Really heavy soundtrack. And, it's really uh, heavy. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good reference. Yeah. Because it's not... I don't know, I've, I've referenced some metal albums, but it's a different... 
well, production type, you know, when you and his production, um, his production style is much more akin to yours. True. Um, you know, you can listen to that because he's using, you know, a lot of analog synths and a lot of modular yeah. as well as metal guitars and, you know, the Axe FX kind of thing. And yeah, um, it's very different than listening to like a Whitechapel record, which right. is just a you know, more traditional band. Yeah. So, yeah. I, and it's a lot, yeah, a lot drier and all in your face. Yeah. Um, and not like a bunch of room mics or not that there's anything wrong with that. Just different type of yeah. metal, if you will. Well, it's almost like, I mean, it's not almost like it actually, it's electronically produced metal. Yeah. I mean, it's still using all your, a lot of traditional instrumentation. Right. But, um, just the production style of it and all the editing. I mean, it's very, very intensively electronically yeah. produced once all the acoustic elements got in there. Yeah. Grounded in electronics and other things. Yeah. Added. Oh, it's great. It's so good. Um, other ones still a sucker for, um, there goes my brain. Bioshock. Oh, who, it's a who did really the score old for that? game. I can't even remember. Cause real, he does sound design for Bioshock or no, that's mass effect. Yes. I think he did Bioshock too. It's possible. Yeah. He just had a new album come out. Yeah. Coma duster. That's great. I need to listen to that still. I listened to it a lot. Um, driving down to San Diego a couple weekends. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I just had it on loop. You awesome. Know, just going down. Amazing production. Yeah, that guy's so good. He's so good. Um, He's I, one of those guys that every time I listen, just get frustrated with myself. I know. <laughs> I wish I wish he lived here. Me too. Um, he's another one of those guys, just like you know, cut from the same cloth. Yeah. And immensely talented. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. Check it. his new album's awesome. I would definitely give it a listen. Yeah. Homework tonight. I'm on it. Yeah. I'll give he sent me a copy of it. I'll pass it along. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Super sweet dude. Yeah. I think we got what? Like We're we're in the home stretch here. Twenty beers left? Yep. Just <sighs> about. We've been doing good. I'm proud of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even you know, with the pauses, not pauses in conference, but pauses in pouring. Making good time. Yeah. It's like the thing with a good meal. You know a meal's good when no one's talking? Exactly. You know a chat's good when no one's pouring? <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. Which? Well, that joke. I mean, the beer is just god-awful as oh, well. Yeah. But, you know, I just meant more my stupid oh. joke. I thought it was lovely. Why, thank you. I appreciate your support. Here for you. Thank you. <laughs> What's next? What do you want to do next? Um, well, like I was saying, the films, games, um, yeah, those are definitely work wise. That's what's on the menu for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I certainly don't want to leave trailers cause no, I love it. No, no, no. It's kind of natural for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, work wise those, um, personally though, I, I want to finish this EP and then just start another. Um, yeah. Because like I was saying, I kind of had that shift of, oh, wait a minute. I can still do emotional music. And right. I like this. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> so I want to do more of that. Um, I don't know. Do a couple more remixes. Yeah. I really love doing remixes. Yeah. Um, what was the last one you did? It's an unreleased one. Which hopefully will be released someday, uh -huh. um, but it's for at the drive-in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which right. that one for me was. Uh, yeah, they're quintessential to our teenage years. Yeah, me yeah. growing up. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's it's weird the way life takes you on these weird paths, and the longer you, you kind of survive LA as a musician, a lot of these people start either coming into your friend's circle or you come into theirs or it's just one yeah. small circle that gets, yeah. you know, um, so yeah, uh, Tony, the drummer from at the drive has become a good friend of mine. So amazing. Yeah. And he's just like the most sweet person and so sincere, which yeah. is really hard to find extremely. Um, yeah. So yeah, I I mean it was kind of an unofficial 
remix, but he gave me stems years ago to do one. Okay. Uh, but I just got caught up in, you know, doing trailer stuff or just doing, just trying to pay the rent, basically. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so I really didn't have any time to do remixes, let alone personal music or anything. So now that I can kind of afford time, which is a weird thing to say, Yeah. Um, I'd love to do more remixes like that for people that I love yeah, or just work on their albums. That's like, it's funny. The music I listen to nowadays, I have a really hard time listening to music. If it's from someone that I don't know. Really? Yeah. In some way, like I just really, or not associate more with, but like, I'm just more intrigued because I kind of know, somewhat of the backstory while certain projects were being written yeah, or no, just there, there's more of an story. emotional connection to it. Yeah. yeah. Or how, how that person or those people are when they're not being interviewed or not on stage. It's, it's just, yeah, you know, you get to see who they actually are and a glimpse into their life. So being able to pairing that with their music yeah, for me is a totally different experience than like, here's a cool new record. Right. I'll still listen to it, but I get so much more. Yeah, when you have an yeah. emotional connection to them. Yeah, um, I just get more out of it. And there's something to be said, though. I mean, because I mean, it's kind of amazing, also, though, when you build an emotional connection to a record that you don't like. Jane Doe, for instance. Oh yeah. We don't know converge. No. But. The way that record hit either of us, or both of us, I should say, yeah. at that period in our lives, we're both wearing Converge shirts right now, you know? It's true. 20 years, 15, 16 years later. Yeah. Like, so I, I think, you know, there's definitely, there's a power also in not knowing somebody because it allows you to apply your own, um, your own meaning. Yeah. And it's harder to do that if you... If you know the person firsthand, then right. you know the backstory. Right. So without that, the vagueness, in a way, makes it more applicable to your actual own life. Yeah. And that's fascinating to me. I don't know. I like that. I get that. And I, it's for me now, that's a little bit harder. Or maybe not harder, but more rare, just because when you're a kid, you're so angsty and angry about everything and like still feeling what real heartbreak feels like for the very first time. And you're feeling all these like the highs and lows of life for the very first time. So a lot of that music sticks with you or like you find something that suddenly matches this new feeling. Yeah. Uh, And not saying that I've felt every emotion that I'll ever feel, but I feel like I have that less the older I am. So, you know, I was actually thinking this earlier today. Now that, you know, we're in our thirties, lived a little bit of life at this point. Do you think it hurts less? No, no. Okay. I didn't think so. No way. Um, the same, if not more. Yeah. I think you just know how to process your feelings. Yeah. Um, I think I'm definitely better at processing it, but I think also now it hurts more for me because it's no longer, it's less about fulfilling a fantasy. Yeah. And now it's more about, you know, building a life with somebody. Totally. So when that goes away, it actually hurts more. It's not just like a silly fantasy or something that wasn't real go away. It's something that actually like truly meant something. Yeah. For me, it's, um, obviously heartache always hurts, but like, I don't know, I guess in my last relationship, one of the big issues and faults on my part was like, I still have this thing that I carry from my early twenties or later twenties. So like, I got to pay the bills. I got to make sure work gets done. I got to be working. Right. Um, so taking, Taking time away to just live life. It's important. It is important, and I'm pretty bad at it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's just because 
that whole concept of, well, if you're not going to do this job, somebody will. Yeah, there's um, the rat race side of it, certainly. But, and you don't want to theoretically miss out on an opportunity that could be a big deal. Yeah. But by that same token, it's important, I think, to say no sometimes just because you need time for yourself. You need time for your loved ones. Yeah. You know, you need to have a life that extends beyond just you and your computer. What? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Imagine that concept. Yeah. So I don't know. I've gotten better at it. Um, I'm not great at it. And honestly, when I take time for myself, I still take time by myself. Yeah. But um, it's necessary. It really, I feel rejuvenated after. So that way when I come back to work, I'm, I'm ready to go. Yeah. And that matters. So. Do you find that with your own music or work music as well? All of the above. Okay. Yeah. Um, I get less exhausted. Or I don't get exhausted as quickly when it's my own music. When it's work music, yeah. Like after, if I'm staring at something for eight hours, just doing the same thing, client job or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm destroyed. I'm totally fried. With my own record, if it's something I'm really into, yeah, I'll be in the studio till four o'clock in the morning with a bottle of wine. Yeah. And I have to force myself to stop. Yep. And that's the best feeling, you know? It is. Like that that's absolutely the best. And I wish I wish that stuff paid like client work oh, did, you know? Yeah. Because then I wouldn't ever do it. Um but you know. Is what it is. Yeah. So one day, you know, something to aspire to. But no, I find, I find I will hit the wall usually with my own work after five days straight. Okay. When I've been doing the same record for five days after, by the time I get to like the fourth, fifth day, I'm just, I can't see the forest for the trees anymore. And then I know I need to, take a few days off or if it works out yeah. conveniently that I have to go, you know, go travel and play shows or something like that. Great. Because yeah, that does the work for me. I think I never really get there only because like I was saying, the trailer stuff is always, it's always short form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you never like need, not never, but to step back, doesn't take how do i say this the right way um well because your time the amount of time you have invested in it yeah generally isn't as much you don't get burnt out as quickly but it's also not part typically part of a whole right so it's one idea that if i just plow through this and if i just work for 15 hours right right then it's just done right and it's not like later on i have to figure out how this fits with the other tracks on an album or into a full score or right, right, right. Um, it's just one idea. Yeah. Yeah. That makes it easier. I know we only have like eight left total. It's happening. I know we've done a good, I'm saving the Bud Light Lime for last <laughs> just because fuck that. Thing. Cause you want another sip? You know what? I, I feel like we should both take sips of that for the oh, very last God. moment. And then, uh, yeah, we'll just cut the recording at us spitting it out. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> it's so bad. It's so bad. I like, how do people like, obviously it sells. Yeah. And I was shocked at how cheap it was. It was like seven bucks for a six pack or something. Seven ninety nine. Like oh my God. And here we are paying $15. Yeah. Not for stone. Thanks to like the brewery at Stone. Oh my God. It's like 10 bucks to fill a growler. It makes so much sense to go there. Oh my God. It's amazing. I love you, Stone. Thank you. Thank you, Stone. Mm Mm-hmm. There's a reason why they're on my writer. I believe it. Stone IPA everywhere I go. Yeah. Because I can get it everywhere in the States. That is awesome. Usually. It gets me in trouble. Why? When they don't give me Stone. Ah. Sometimes I get the mystery beer, you know, that is way oh, strong and just not prepared for it. 
well, I just don't know what I'm getting, you know? And yeah. then it's a 10% alcohol beer, and... All of a sudden, you're three deep, four deep. I, I have three of them while I'm playing or something like that, and I get off the stage, and I can't walk. Mm. That's a problem. Good times. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So, you know, it's good to know what you're drinking. Always good. Yeah, so that's why... Stone IPA is a perfect gig beer. Amen. Yeah. I'll drink to that. Brand it. Stone IPA. The perfect gig beer for the active <laughs> DJ. <laughs> it could battle banquet beer. What's banquet beer? Isn't that Coors? Ugh. Yeah. Is that is it a brand or is it a? No, it's like Coors the the banquet beer. I well, like Miller Highlight High Life. Yeah, oh. right. The champagne of beers. Mm. Which more like the three dollar? Oh, the champagne s- of beers. My oh. buddy always has this good line. I don't know where he got it, but. It applies to Miller yeah. High Life. Champagne for my real friends and real pain for my sham friends. <laughs> oh, I like that one. I've heard that before. I like that a lot. It's a good one. Do you have a hard time finding real friends in LA? I do. Yeah. A really hard time. Um, I mean, either between just... People being genuine or people having time. Mm-hmm. Like most of my friends are musicians yeah. uh, or filmmakers or self-employed. Yeah. yeah. So everyone's always busy, right. which isn't a bad thing, but it's, it's not the kind of busy where like it's I work hard. nine to five and then I have the weekends off. Right. Well, you got to drink at seven. Yeah. Yeah. You like, can't do that. All of my friends, and I totally get this, and I'm the same way, like, work's done when it's done. Yeah. And I have to work till whenever that is. And so do my friends. Or if you're a touring musician, like, okay, you're here for three weeks and then gone for four months. Yep. And then back for a week and, you know, people have families, people have significant others. So when you get off tour, probably the first thing you're going to want to do is just hide out with your girlfriend, your wife, Whatever. hang out with your kids. Yeah. Um, so it makes it makes a, uh, building relationships mm-hmm. a lot harder. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then the whole kind of flakiness mm-hmm. of people in LA. The LA flake. Yeah. Yeah. It really bums me out. Yeah. Me too. So, winning. Well, fortunately, we found each other. We did. So, let's uh, celebrate that by opening this. our last two beers. There are these Bud Light Limes. Cheers. Cheers, buddy. <laughs> Take a big gulp. Spit it out. Well, don't spit it out unless you absolutely have to. Like, if, if it's... Uh, oh, we're going to actually drink this. No, you can try. I mean... Last time it was like immediate, like not projectile vomiting, but like projectile spitting. It, yeah. So if, if projectile spitting happens, then you know what? I can't stop that. Okay. Okay. Well, here's to you, my man. Back at you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Mm. Mm. <coughs> mm, 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 mm. Oh, fuck. Mm mm. That was Anthony Baldino and 100 beers down the drain. Good times. Uh, Go check out his music. He's on SoundCloud, Spotify, all the above. He actually did a remix for my track, Inside My Head, which came out about a year ago on Mousetrap. And yeah, super fun to always have him around and really fun to be able to share this and just do the silly shit that we usually do on our own free time. And now you're involved. Now you know. Don't hate us. Okay. Bye.